The U.S. Declaration of Independence states that every citizen is endowed with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Today I want to talk to you about our pursuit of happiness. You see, for much of my life, I struggled to find true happiness until I discovered what I'm about to share with you. But before I do, let's get the lay of the land and create a happiness map to guide us on our journey. If you go to the Amazon book section and you type in the search keyword happiness, you get 60,000 results. Just to put that in context, if you read one book a day, it'll take you 165 years to read that many books. That's a lot of authors writing a lot of books. As we all know, oftentimes, demand drives supply. Dr. Lori Santos recently created the most popular course in the 300-year history of Yale University. What is this course that one quarter of all freshmen are dying to take? It's called Psychology and the Good Life, which focuses heavily on our pursuit of happiness. Here's another data point that you might find interesting. The U.S. self-improvement market for 2021 was $11 billion. That's billion with a B. It's clear that our pursuit of happiness is big business. Let's keep it rolling. 2020 World Happiness Report. Yes, there is such a thing. Does its best to measure subjective well-being around the world. In the report, the U.S. ranks number 19 in the world, sandwiched between the Czech Republic and Belgium. You might say respectable ranking perhaps, but you also might wonder why a country with the wealth, technology, and abundance of the U.S. wouldn't rank higher. Well, here's some clues. Statistics also show that anxiety, depression, loneliness, and even suicidal ideation are all climbing. Making matters worse, young adults suffer even higher rates of loneliness. I think you'd agree these are not happiness metrics. I know what you're thinking right now. I can read your mind. You're saying, hey, Ron, have you seen the headlines? <laughs> We're in the middle of a global pandemic. I definitely hear you. It's been a tough couple of years. And by the way, it's nice to see some, some smiling faces out there. It's been a tough couple of years. But be careful with that thinking. Because it wasn't a rosy picture before the pandemic started, nor will putting it in our rearview mirror alleviate the problem. All these data suggest we are executing poorly in our pursuit of happiness. I think you'd agree. It's not for a lack of trying. Could it be? that we're confused as to what will deliver happiness to our doorstep? Let's start with the def one of the many definitions of happiness as we continue our mapping process. In the field of positive psychology, happiness is described as the experience of joy, contentment, pleasure, uh, and, or a positive experience, and also a sense that one's life is good, meaningful, and worthwhile. In my own experience as the founder of Forging Metal, a podcast host, and a professor at the University of Colorado, I've asked countless students, guests, and clients to describe happiness. As you might guess, all of these are a little bit different. There are some commonalities like spending time with loved ones, financial security, good health, but there's always something missing. I've yet to have anybody use words like hardship, adversity, discomfort in their definition of happiness. Which makes sense, right? It doesn't sound fun. But is that a problem? Should those be part of a good life? Perhaps we start to see cracks in the foundation of our happiness model. But let's dig a little deeper. Beginning with the topic of contentment. For our ancestors, contentment or status quo would have gotten them killed. You see, food, shelter, and even sex require getting off the couch and pursuing difficult challenges. And I would say if you've ever tried online dating, you know what it means to pursue difficult challenges. <laughs> the bottom line is being content for extended periods of time was not a winning proposition for them nor for us. Yet, many definitions of happiness including the one I just shared, 
mentioned being content. Is this a problem? Should we be content? If we are content, improvement will not happen. If we are content, we may never get off the couch, right? We may binge watch Netflix forever. Discontent is going to drive our motivation to change. And although discontent drives our motivation to improve, I'm also not advocating a life of never enough. That can be just as unhealthy as a life of contentment. So if you can imagine contentment on a sliding scale, on one end of the spectrum we have pure content, on the opposite side a never-ending state of discontent. Loitering at the extreme ends of this spectrum will not deliver the happiness we seek. We need to learn to move the sliding scale back and forth throughout our lives to suit our needs. There will be times in life that call for being content. To pause, rest, recharge, to savor, to take a breath. And there will be times to get out of our comfort zone and push ourselves for hard, meaningful goals and be out of breath. We need to look at this pursuit as a series of sprints rather than a steady state marathon. We are not machines. We need to cycle between stress and rest to be at our best. I've run 50 miles three times, traversing the high altitude rugged mountains surrounding Leadville, Colorado, with peaks that tower 14,000 feet toward the sky. It takes a back-of-the-pack runner like me about 14 hours to cover that distance. You can imagine paying a 40% tax on your oxygen intake. Inclement weather like wind, rain, hail, and snow are four wild cards in this deck. It's long, steep climbs with many bumps in the road. Many hours of pain, adversity, discomfort, never-ending inner dialogue, loneliness, and yes, a whole lot of boredom all of which will put your mental health and physical endurance to the test. It's an incredible feat of human will to continue moving forward when all you want to do is lay down and quit. The best part of running 50 miles should come as no surprise. It's when you cross that beautiful finish line and you know the pain is finally over. The hardship and discomfort from a very long day and many miles has finally come to its dramatic conclusion. But the second best part of running 50 miles may surprise you. Any guesses? It is the hot shower that soothes your aching body and washes away all the trail dust. Gathered from 100,000 footsteps in those beautiful rugged mountains. How can something as simple as a shower become pure bliss? Something so mundane, something most of us do every day, brings so much joy. Well, it turns out that the adversity and hardship that I overcame led to my savoring of this simple experience. Here's where it starts to get fun. I had inadvertently stumbled onto something. This wasn't just in my imagination. Research has shown that facing adversity actually increases our capacity for savoring. So what is savoring? Savoring is the appreciation to attend to, appreciate, and enhance positive experiences in our lives. You can think of, um, so savoring is enjoying the process rather than focusing on the outcome of enjoyment. You can think of savoring as a positive experience of enjoyment. Savoring has elements of mindfulness, gratitude, and pleasure, but it's slightly more than each of these, elevated to a higher plane of existence. You can be mindful but not savor. You can have gratitude, absent act of appreciation. You can have pleasure without being attuned to the source of your pleasure. Making the process of savoring even more elusive, affluence has been shown 
to actually decrease our capacity for savoring. As we remove the bumps in the road of life, we get quite accustomed to a smooth road. In the process, we begin to lose our ability to be resilient. Making matters worse, we become fragile to the storms of life. Which is quite contrary to what we were taught by societal norms, right? We're led to believe that wealth and a life of leisure will lead to the happiness we desire. If running 50 miles isn't your thing, how many people say 50 miles? No way, Ron. You could do it, you could do it. All you need to do is train. But if 50 miles, running 50 miles is not your thing, here's an example you more, more readily relate to. Last year, I contracted COVID-19. Like many of you, I suspect, I lost my sense of taste and smell. Each day, I would try to revive my senses. I would do crazy things like I'd put coffee beans, lemon, chocolate, even garlic up to my nose, and I would sniff. Nothing seemed to work. How I missed those senses I'd known for a lifetime and never gave a second thought. When my, sense of, my, when my senses finally returned, I felt like a little kid again. I savored the smell of everything in my vicinity. Tree leaves, fresh cut grass, sweet spring air, my morning coffee. <sighs> I breathed it in deeply. It was all so wonderful. Again, my savoring had been made possible by the adversity I faced and the hardship I overcame. As I make a case for savoring, here's another nugget of wisdom. As we practice savoring, we tend to cope better and forge our ability to be resilient and strong. In fact, focusing on the positive has been shown to create important advantages in the coping process. You can think of savoring as the positive counterpart to coping. You're saying, okay, how does adversity fit into this, Ron? Glad you asked. Facing hardship creates a pathway toward enhanced appreciation of positive events. In fact, somewhat surprisingly, moderate levels of adversity throughout our life leads to fewer post-traumatic stress symptoms, less global distress, and increased life satisfaction. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good to me. But here's the thing. If I were to say, I have a magic wand and I can make all of your adversity go away for the rest of your life. How many people are buying what I'm selling? I've asked a lot of people this, and usually I get a, a really resounding yes. Please make it go away, Ron. The pain and discomfort, I want it all to go away. Maybe adversity has gotten a bad rap. Maybe adversity is not the boogeyman we've made it out to be. In this new mindset that embraces rather than avoids adversity, we can begin to move beyond post-traumatic stress into post-traumatic growth. If you can imagine a new happiness model that makes room for adversity as an ally in our pursuit of happiness, as we go around the cycle of adversity, savoring, resilience, we build our happiness muscle. As we've learned, facing and overcoming adversity can lead to increased savoring. This increased savoring then leads to greater resilience and better coping. We get stronger with each evolution, better equipped to face the next storm of life. It is in this contrast between happiness and adversity that adds rich color and texture to our lives. It is without this contrast of hard and soft, our lives become smooth, gray, and listless, devoid of meaning, fulfillment, and savoring. Some of the happiest people I've known are the ultra runners that run long distances over the mountains and through the woods. These nutbags, as they're often called, <laughs> have discovered the secret of happiness. They purposely invite 
adversity, adventure, and hardship into their lives as the missing ingredients for their happiness potion. For they know on the other side of adversity is the happiness we all seek. I've been a rodeo bull rider, a semi-professional baseball player, and an aerobatic pilot. I've built an airplane, completed an Ironman triathlon, and run dozens of ultra marathons. I've done hard things. Let me share a few things that I learned along the way that you might find useful. As I did hard things, I got better at doing hard things. What was once hard became easier and less intimidating. I encourage you not to let a daunting adventure paralyze you. Dance with fear and embrace your discomfort. As I did more difficult things, I also noticed I was more fulfilled. And happiness surprisingly came along for the ride. This is not what I expected. Paradoxically, doing hard things actually led to the happiness I was seeking. I too had finally discovered the secret. As I wrap up, this is where this old ball player is going to spin you a curveball. The focus of this talk so far has been what? The pursuit of happiness. I have been seduced by the siren call of happiness, and perhaps so have you. The problem, with ha the problem with happiness is not how we define it. The definitions are perfectly valid. Feeling joy, contentment, and even pleasure are exactly how happiness should feel. The solution to our problem is that the pursuit of happiness should not be our obsession. Let me say that again. The pursuit of happiness should not be our obsession. You say, wait a minute, Ron. Psychologist Iris Mouse calls this curveball the paradoxical pursuit of happiness. She found in her research that the more passionately we pursue happiness, the less likely we are to actually find it. In fact, this obsession with happiness can actually lead to depression if we're not careful. With all due respect, our forefathers got it wrong. You and I should not be pursuing a happy life but rather a fulfilling life. Let me share a quick example to make my point. If I eat jelly donuts every day, Ron's probably going to be pretty happy. It's going to be tasty and filling, but not fulfilling. In a good life, we need to make room for the hard stuff. Right next to our delicious jelly donut, we need to add some broccoli to our plate. This is the new approach to happiness we desperately need to right our listing ship. As I wrap up, let me share the wise immortal words. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. As I wrap up, let me share, let me share Three challenges when you're ready. First, if adversity arrives without an invitation, look at it as a gift that will make you stronger. We grow through overcoming hardship. Reappraise it as a positive rather than negative event. Relish the challenge that has come to your doorstep. Second, actively practice saving your life. Make a habit of appreciating the little things that life has to offer. Enhance and prolong your positive experiences whenever you get the chance. Pause and appreciate the roses. Lastly, if adversity does not visit, create your own adversity to test your will, strengthen your character, and enhance your capacity for savoring. What challenge will you take on that will jolt you from your comfortable slumber and push you into the wild frontier. Try something that scares you. You may want to run long distances, embark on a cross-country adventure, or come up on this lonely stage and do a TED Talk. It's going to be difficult at times, but you are built for this. You and I share the genes of survivors. Trust that you are stronger than you realize. Now, let me share the wise immortal words of the Stoic philosopher 
Seneca the Younger, who once said, the things hardest to bear are the sweetest to remember. I encourage you to embrace adversity and seek fulfillment in your pursuit of the good life. I'll see you in the arena, and don't forget to eat your broccoli. Thank you.